Did you see how black her hands looked? Oh no, I didn't see that. And that happens when everything is shutting down. Your hands, your extremities turn dark because everything goes. So they got her up and dressed, by gosh. She worked the day before she died. I wondered how her head, you know, how her mind was that day. Right, right. There's Mike Roberts. Hi, Mike. Good to Hi, see Mike. you. Nice to see we're, you. We're all greeting you. We're, we're supposed to talk these days. I remember when Sherry was president, she set all these up. Um, it, I was working from home for two months and I was so grateful for the chance to talk to people. It is nice to be able to. And I work from home all the time now. I don't see, you know, people <laughs> on the weekends mostly. I saw Mike this weekend. Did you? Yeah. I think I almost hit him with a golf ball. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> is that true, Mike? Can't like the react. September 12th meeting of the Rotary Club of Georgia. Oh, okay, I guess. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, singing of our national anthem, and repeating the four way test. I pledge allegiance. Oh, say. Let's repeat the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Our invocation today is by Sharon Hamilton. I am going to read a prayer this morning uh, by Sister Joan Chittister. She was at Chautauqua this year. Um, she is one of their favorites, I think maybe because she um, lives in Erie, but she is famous worldwide and she is not your typical nun. The prayer I am going to read is uh, one for conscience and courage. and shape, to challenge and energize both the light and the world you have given us. God of light and God of darkness, God of conscience and God of courage, lead us through this time of spiritual confusion and public uncertainty. Lead us beyond fear, apathy, and defensiveness to a new hope in you and to hearts full of faith. Give us the conscience it takes to comprehend what we are facing to see what we are looking at and to say what we see so that others hearing us may also brave the pressure that comes with being out of public sight. Give us the courage we need to confront those things that compromise our conscience or threaten our integrity. Give us most of all the courage to follow those before us, to challenge wrong and change it, whatever the cost to themselves. We ask all this in the precious name of our Lord. Thank you, Sharon. Please welcome President-elect Ruth Lundeen to announce our visiting Rotarians and guests. Well, so, so good to see everyone again after a couple of weeks off. Uh, great to have a, gr a wonderful crowd here. Today we are welcoming Enid Carpe, Carpe Diaz, who is a guest of Marion Beckering. Welcome, welcome. 
And we welcome our favorite greeter, Marissa Troxel. Who knows better how to greet somebody who's a guest than a guest? Um, John, I hope this is the last time. Welcome, John Felton. <laughs> yes, a very good one. <laughs> and we also want to welcome our county executive, PJ Wendell, who is the guest of David Troxel today. And hiding in the back. But if he stands up, he's very tall. Yoa from Denmark, our exchange student. Thank you, Ruth. Announcements. A rotarily yours recorder today is Eric Harvey. As always, many thanks to you and the communications committee for all you do to keep our club informed. There's a 50-50 greeter sign up going around, so please sign up, easy way to serve the club. Friday, this Friday, September 16th, we have a board meeting and it's gonna be at the Chautauqua Blind Association instead of Gebby. Again, it's at the Chautauqua Blind Association instead of Gebby, 8 a.m. this Friday. Any other announcements? Yes, I, I've got a couple of announcements. One is that the DEI, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, will be meeting on Wednesday, September 21st at 3 p.m. At uh, it's a it's a hybrid, so you can either attend via Zoom or at the uh, Chautauqua Region Community Foundation. So that's three o'clock on the 21st. I would also, I think we have our new, our first new uh, membership badges. Thanks to uh, Melissa. And I just wanted to have you think about um, what your classification is. Because a classification is not your um, uh, job, job title. It's not your business. It's how you perceive yourself interacting in the community. And I've been thinking long and hard on this. And I, so I'm not retired nature center director, but I consider myself a nature educator. So as you think about this, um, think, try, try and put some good thoughts to it because uh, part of what Rotary is all about is, is having diverse professions. And so think about what your profession is and then we'll all think about how we can welcome more diverse professions. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Any other announcements? Okay, please welcome David Troxel, who will introduce PJ Weld Wendell and make a special proclamation for September. Um, I brought notes. Um, most of you know that uh, September has been set aside every year by the Rotary International Foundation and uh, administration to highlight literacy. So we have Literacy Month during the month of September and the Rotary Foundation puts a lot of uh, emphasis on reading and writing and education for children. And we do this because we, we know that educated people um, are probably going to make better decisions in their lives and they're going to do have a lot more compassion for each other and probably build stronger society. So that's a big value in Rotary Club. Um, we have our own literacy committee here in this club and it's a great committee and it's led by Diana Meckley. And I wonder if anybody that's on that committee here could stand up today so we could recognize them for the great work that they do over the years. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, this committee has worked with the Jamestown Public School System over the years in their reading programs with LEAP and side-by-side -side reading. And some of you in this club have actually gone to sit side-by-side -side with students in Washington and Bush and uh, love schools. And that's been a great program. We have a, a program, an ongoing program called Literacy, Laundromat Literacy. And we've, we've chosen the three busiest laundromats in Jamestown and put bookshelves in them and keep those filled with uh, books for children and adults and those bookshelves are full and 
they're free. And I don't know how many of those books have gone out over the years. Over 700 books have gone off of those shelves for people in the laundromat, which is a great idea. Um, we're working on a project now on the literacy committee called, is it Bibs and Books? Where every new mother that delivers a baby at UPMC will go home with a bib for a baby that says, read to me on it. And it has a, does it have a rotary emblem, Marion? Yeah, Marion's doing a lot of that. Um, and, uh, and a book. And the books will be in, some of those are bilingual, is that right, Paulette? Yeah, some of those are bilingual to sort of emphasize the crossover between uh, literacy and language. Um, so we do a lot of uh, work with people that have difficulty in reading and, and young children. Um, so this year, this summer, we decided to take a look at people that didn't need help with reading, but just read. And that's book clubs. Um, groups of people that get together with each other around the county just for the joy of reading, which is a, a wonderful thing. So we've tried to decide how do we find book clubs? And that was not easy because they're not in the yellow pages. So we, uh, we went to bookstores and we went to libraries around the county and word of mouth and looked for book clubs and we found book clubs. We found lots of different kinds of book clubs. We found uh, book clubs that had just started and book clubs that were 30 years old, small book clubs that had four people and large book clubs that had 25 people. We found book clubs that meet in the summer, but not in the winter and book clubs that meet in the winter, but not in the summer, all kinds of book clubs. Uh, Melissa Myers went out and inter interviewed a book club in Bemis Point and said she had such so much fun that she wanted to join a book club. So it was a very nice, a way to gather information. I think Deb Kaplan went out and interviewed a book club in the South Side, sponsored by a Novel Destinations Bookstore, where they don't even choose a book. They choose a topic every month and everybody brings their own book and they talk about that. So we had a lot of fun doing that and boosting and highlighting book clubs. And so we gathered out all that information together and put it into a newspaper article, which will be coming out sometime soon, right, Sue Jones? Uh, well, that brings me to my final point. The icing on the cake with all of this is that I ran into Mr. Wendell at a function a few uh, weeks ago, and we were talking about book clubs, which he supports. And I like book clubs. I'm in a book club. Uh, Walt's in a book club. Um, and uh, we talked about this idea of setting aside the month of September to proclaim uh, Chautauqua County Book Club Month. Um, and so we came up with this idea of a proclamation. So, and what's even better is we have Mr. Wendell here today, taking, taking time out of his busy schedule to come down to introduce his proclamation to our very own Rotary Cup. So thank you very much and it over to you. Pleasure, thank you. So some housekeeping, I do have to remind for those of you, oh, sorry. And I see Sherry's picture up here in the corner. For those of you who remember my daughter, Sydney, uh, she just called as I was walking across asking what I was doing today. Um, and she misses everyone here. She was only home for about a week and apologizes she couldn't get to a meeting. But I can't say enough, and I, I, I revel this to everybody about the training and what Rotary does. And Yoa is back there as an exchange student knows. The preparation that goes in for our young people to have these, challenge, these um, experiences to go abroad is, is phenomenal. Um, she spent her first semester of college in, I'll take it back, she was home. She should have been in Valen uh, Valencia, Spain. Uh, she did come back. This summer, she's going to Dubrovnik, Croatia. So in a very good way, you sort of created your own little monster of wanting to travel the world. And, you know, I know Andy is an executive and others ask you, what are you going to do to bring kids back here to Chautauqua County? And my fight is to bring my own daughter back to this country. So I appreciate what everybody's done. But, you know, when Dave talked to me, it was just right after the events really took place on August 12th, and where we found literacy thrust Chautauqua County in the forefront of really what was an international incident. But something I definitely support, literacy is something that empowers all of us. It embraces creativity. You know, when somebody once said, if you ever watch somebody reading a book, why are you laughing? Or if you hear somebody tell you a story, why are you laughing? Because it engages your mind and you really start to envision what you're listening to or what you're reading, especially. Uh, I sometimes cheat and listen to books online, which helps me. But again, it's uniqueness about literacy and, and it empowers so many people in so many 
so many different activities. So on behalf of myself as a proclamation, whereas literacy in its forms of writing and reading provide the foundation blocks of an informed and democratic society, and whereas literature shared amongst friends and in groups, such as through book clubs, promotes understanding and compassionate worldviews, and whereas book clubs allow participants to come together to strengthen their reading comprehension, writing, and critical thinking skills as they explore literary works and the new perspectives that they might provide. And whereas Rotary Clubs, like the Rotary Club of Jamestown, are committed to raising awareness and supporting literacy in our schools, libraries, and other programs. Now, therefore, I, Paul M. Wendell, Jr., Chautauqua County Executive, do hereby proclaim the month of September of 2022 as Chautauqua County Book Club Month in Chautauqua County and encourage all citizens to raise awareness about the importance of book clubs to further the education of our youth and promote lifelong learning for adults. I witness whereof and have to set my hand and the great seal of the County of Chautauqua to be affixed on this 12th day of September, 2022. So on behalf of myself and the residents, we proclaim September Chautauqua County Book Club Month. Thank you, County Executive. And David Troxell, thank you for Uh-oh. <laughs> Hello. I think the microphone must not be working. We talked about this the other day at one of the meetings out of that. Oh. Huh. Is the microphone working? It should be check, check. We can hear you now. Thank you. Let's give a warm welcome to Sue Jones, who will help us celebrate our September birthdays. Before we celebrate September birthdays, I want to wish a happy belated birthday to Yola, whose birthday was August 11th. Congratulations. Now, you know why we celebrate these birthdays. It's for generous contributions to the Rotary Foundation. And yay, there we go. When I think of the Rotary Foundation, immediately what comes to my mind is polio. And this has been on my mind more and more lately as we hear of isolated new cases of polio. So I just want to quickly remind you all that we still have great, great work to do. And please be generous in your contributions to the foundation. It doesn't have to be the birthday if you suddenly come into a small sum of money or a large sum of money, you might think of sharing it with the polio fund in the foundation. Enough said because October is World Polio Day and lots more is coming your way. So we will celebrate birthday. The first one is Kathy Birch, whose birthday was September 4th. She is our illustrious treasurer who has disappeared with the money today someplace. <clears throat> oh, good. Oh, JC Elsie today, huh? Okay, I'm sorry, you're the treasurer. Yes. She's JCLC, which is you know, RCJCSF. And if you know those initials, okay. But in, in real life, Kathy is the chief financial officer of the Gebby Foundation. She attended Jamestown Community College, which is a great 
basis for all of our young people in Chautauqua County and thereabouts. And she then went on and got her Bachelor of Science in Business Administration at Houghton College through JCC. She is a Paul Harris Sustaining Club member. And I don't know if many of you know that she was with the Red Cross for many, many years and then um, down uh, went to the Red Cross in Olean and joined the Olean Club. And she was president of that club before coming back to us. And it's our win. Um, I don't, she didn't say when she was a Paul Harris or when she was the past president, but we wish her a happy pa past birthday on the 4th of September. With us today is Stacy Ann Hannon, who celebrated her birthday on September 7th. <clears throat> she is the publisher and owner of the Jamestown Gazette, woohoo, who gives us great coverage every week in the paper. She attended Jamestown Community College as well and has great things to say about the Small Business Administration down there who helped her um, get ready to take on a new business. I, Irene, I think you were a help in that. Uh, she is a Paul Harris Sustaining Club member and she is a past president in 2009, 2010 and the proud owner of two Paul Harris Fellows. Congratulations, Stacy. Lori Brocklebank's birthday is September 10th. She is the area, area manager of DRG, and I learned this, this is new for me, Davy Resource Group. She is National Resource Consulting and teaches honor courses in multidisciplines of urban forestry. Guess where she went, Greg? Yes, e SUNY ESF at Syracuse. She is a Paul Harris Sustaining Club member. She was sponsored by Tori Ergang. Welcome to Lori, who has been among the missing, but she's probably out roaming through a forest. Randy Sweeney is also celebrating his birthday this month on September 10th, the same day my son was born. <laughs> he is the retired executive director of the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation. He attended Jamestown Community College and SUNY Fredonia. He's a Paul Harris Sustaining Club member, and he has two Paul Harris Fellows, 2004 and 2017. Happy birthday, Randy. Happy birthday to our illustrious president, John Healy, who will celebrate on September 14th with all of his family. He is the assistant director of the Builders Exchange of the Southern Tier and Amer American Digital Services. He attended Mount University of Mount Union and the Franciscan University of Steubenville. Steubenville. He is a Paul Harris Sustaining Club member. He was sponsored by Vince Horrigan, and we wish you a happy upcoming birthday. Michelle Jones. Her birthday is next Sunday, September 18th ingrained in my brain because she's my daughter-in-law. She is now the area manager for um, Northwest Savings Bank, no, Northwest Bank, taking over for Joelle. And she attended Houghton College and St. Bonaventure University. She is a member of the Paul Harris Sustaining Club. She is a Paul Harris Fellow in 2019 and 2022. Happy upcoming birthday. And to our longest serving member, Bill Larson, he will turn 95 on September 24th. Happy birthday up there, one of our great followers. He is a retired advertising agency owner and leader. He attended Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. He's a Paul Harris Sustaining Club member. He is an honorary member as of the golf tournament. He is past president from 1980 to 1981, and he has two Paul Harris Fellows, 1985 and 2014, and he and his beautiful bride, Carol, have been married for 73 years. Happy birthday, Bill. Lisa Yagi. 
will celebrate her birthday on September 29th, which I never forget. She is the senior human resources business partner at Refresco Beverages. She attended Allegheny College and has her BA in economics. She's a Paul Harris Sustaining Club member and was president in 2007, 2008. She was a past district governor, assistant district governor, excuse me. Um, and she has two Paul Harris fellows, 2008 and 2014. Happy birthday, Lisa. And the reason I never forget Lisa is because my birthday is the same day, September 29th. I am retired communications coordinator from the Board of Public Utilities, which I love doing. It was great fun. I am also a retired registered nurse, and I loved working at Jamestown General Hospital for many, many, many years. I'm a Paul Harris Sustaining Club member. I was sponsored by Dudley Erickson, past president in 2011, 2012. And I have four Paul Harris Fellows, 2005, 12, 16, and 19. Happy birthday to me. Now, the reason, <clears throat> the reason I like to call it the September Sapphire's birthday is because sapphires are the stones that are in our Paul Harris Fellow pins. So happy birthday to our September Sapphires. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sapphires. Happy birthday to you. And our birthday free lunch goes to Lori Brocklebank. Maybe she will get here. Thank you, Sue. A new member introduction, fellow Rotarians. It is my pleasure and privilege today to welcome into membership in our club, John Felton, who is proposed by Diana Meckley. This proposal has been reviewed in accordance with our club's bylaws. I invite John and their sponsor, Diana, to join me up front. John Felton, we now proceed to admit you into membership in the Rotary Club of Jamestown, New York, into the fellowship of 32,000 club plus Rotary clubs throughout the world. In your orientation, you've learned that the ideal of Rotary is service to others and their principal motto is service above self. The primary objective of our club and all Rot Rotary clubs is to encourage and foster this ideal. And we are confident you will share in this effort. You've been approved for membership in our club because we believe that you are an outstanding representative of your vocation who subscribes to the ideals of Rotary and who is willing to to share and translating these ideas into effective action. You agree to the obligations of the membership in the club to obey our constitution and bylaws and to be an actively engaged member. You have also learned about out our specific committees, projects, and other aspects of our club's culture during your orientation. We're eager for you to put your gifts and talents to work alongside your fellow Rotarians. I now have the pleasure of asking Diana to pin on the rotary emblem and to present your membership plaque, which we hope you will display with pride. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Jamestown, New York. Fellow Rotarians, I am happy to present you Rotarian John Felton, our newest member, and Diana will now give some background and information. Yes, it is a privilege and a pleasure whenever you, you um, There she is. <laughs> okay. All right. So 
It is my privilege and pleasure to welcome John into the club. And it's one of the most wonderful things you can do as a Rotarian is when you welcome somebody to join the club. Now, John prepared a bio, which I really enjoyed and want to share with you. So John was born in Jamestown in 1961. He's not bashful about his age. And he attended Jamestown Public Schools. As a child, he was very fortunate that his parents and his two brothers were able to travel across the country throughout the United States. John attended and graduated from the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park, New York. Yeah, 1982. Um, a commonly known fact is close to 50% of graduates were likely to switch careers during their lifetime. He had stated this during his graduation speech as he was selected by his peers to address the graduating class. Little did John know that he would be one of those individuals that would not be a lifelong food service employee. Because of family tragedy, he was hired at the credit union. He was one of two employees. The first was his mother, who is his mentor and hero. Little did he know that due to the illness and death of his brother, that he would find the career path that he dearly loves. His mother taught him that business is all about relationships. He was taught to always do what is best for the member, meaning was it fair to all interested? Will it build a better relationship with that member? And will the transaction result in increasing the standard of living for that member? He quickly learned that the members that needed Southern Chautauqua Federal Credit Union the most were members of modest means, members who didn't qualify for credit cards or feel comfortable in traditional banks, members who needed a trusted resource. The philosophy of the business relationship still exists as Southern Chautauqua Federal Credit Union approaches 150 million in assets, have over 17,000 members and almost 75 staff members that operate five full service branches and three high school student staff branches. John has been instrumental in establishing Southern Chautauqua Federal Credit Union as the only community development financial institution credit union in Chautauqua County, which is one of the poorest counties in New York State. Under John's leadership, the credit union received the following awards. The Jontos Avanzamos. Juntos Avanzamos. Thank you. He can help us with our Spanish. From inclusive, recognizing their Hispanic outreach efforts, the DeJarnos, DeJardins, Financial Education Award from the New York Credit Union Association, the Dora Maxwell Social Responsibility Community Service Award from the New York Credit Union Association, Southern Chautauqua Federal Credit Union was also recognized by the National Youth Invo Involvement Board for their Kids Credit Union Program. John was recently recognized by the Business Teachers Association of New York State with the Hobart H. Conover Friend of Business Education Award in 2018-2019. John has served on several local and state boards, including past chair of the New York Credit Union Foundation, the Child Safety Village as president, the treasurer of the New York State Coalition, of community development financial institutions. He's a volunteer at the United Way of Southern Chautauqua County. And the way I met John, he was, you were on the board, right? Of the Child Advocacy Program, which my husband also served on. And that's how I met John. John lives in Lakewood, New York with his family and he enjoys traveling, family time and the occasional golf game of which he put a foursome together for our recent tournament. And another tidbit, um, his brother-in-law is past Jamestown Public School Superintendent, Brett Apthorpe. So he was in our club. 
That was another connection. So please join me in welcoming John to our club. Please get your tickets ready for 50-50. Greg Jones. So we have, uh, after a slight handling fee from the front desk. We have a remaining $53 here. So thank you all for participating in that. And I thought, why don't we have the one Greg in this room who reached the grade of major I'll draw the many tickets. So Greg, please go ahead and do that for us. <laughs> and remember, this Greg did it. So if you're mad, that's the Greg to be mad at. So uh, it is 764231. 764231. Oh my God. <laughs> and Rotary is fun. Doug Conroe. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Right here. Let's fill it up today. We're going to start. Mark had to leave early, so he's put in there. And Russ, gentleman that he is, has donated uh, in recognition of the work the Lake Association has had to challenge this summer. And thank you, Russ. Um, it's been three weeks since I've had the privilege of standing here. And I didn't see any pictures of the paper, so I ought to find everyone for giving three weeks opportunity, but not producing. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold on that if you promise to get your picture in the paper in the next week or two. Okay. All right. Now, oh, Chris, I see Chris over there. Yeah, the guy that's looking back at him. Business first listed a listing of healthy employers in Western New York in 2022. And the resource center was number 15 on the list. And yes, yes. And Denise would normally chip in, but I'm thinking that uh, uh, I was thinking that uh, perhaps uh, Diana would want to chip in on behalf of Denise. Uh, yeah. So, and that's what we have to recognize today. I hope there's a lot of happy bucks. Um, I've seen some news. I've talked to a couple members, but no pictures. But we'll we'll go to the next deep dive. But you know, I keep reminding people to read Rotarian magazine. Oh yeah, good magazine, real good magazine. So, uh, oh, what table? Randy, your table. Okay, you you read it. Now there was a rock the boat. Rotary Club of Galveston, Texas, featured article in there about artist, boat, nonprofit, connecting with 80,000 plus students, connecting with wetlands via kayaks. So what did those 80,000 plus student program did they participate in? And when I talked about the title gives you an idea. <laughs> exactly wrong, but uh, but but helpful. Watercolors of their observations. So you could say that's a study, but the students 
through a great program down there with the Rotary Club of Galveston, Texas, and ended up forming the Artist Boats Coastal Heritage Program that's working to preserve the wetlands there. So thank you. And Mr. President, happy bucks. Happy bucks. I'll get us started. I put five in for first many thanks to Mike Bird and the Golf Committee on another successful golf outing. Nothing we could do about the rain, but we got about nine holes in. Um, just want to recognize Bill Larson and Russ Eklund again. Thank you them for, to them for their many years of service and continued service. And then just a thank you to Lisa Goodell and Kathy Birch, who do a lot behind the scenes to pull these events off. And Sue Jones for all your guys' help with organizing and managing the money of the golf tournament. So thank you. I, uh, you know, they always say that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, uh, Ruth Lundeen paid for my lunch. <laughs> happy buck. Oh, um, yeah. Um, yeah, this is my happy buck for uh, introducing my sister this weekend to all the wonderful joys of Jamestown. And she goes home today on a high, having met all of my fellow Rotarians. So that's five happy bucks there. <laughs> Well, mine is also a, a happy buck for the golf tournament. I have this wonderful picture of Paul having won second place <laughs> because it was a drawing. And so <laughs> thank you to all of the Rotarians who worked hard on the golf tournament. <laughs> um, uh, this time last week, I was uh, probably driving home from Maine because my oldest daughter got married on Saturday the 3rd. Whew. And this is all I have left. Thank you. And my happy bucks are to thank this wonderful community for how they've embraced my sister. I have a dollar from Greg because he's very happy that the windows got cleaned. And I have a few happy bucks because I'm going to miss the next two meetings, but I get to meet my newest grandchild. Logan John was born on the 25th of August, and he'll be almost a month by the time I get to hold him. But he was his sister Blake was almost a month before I got to hold her because of COVID. So at least now it's a happy time. So thank you. I love hearing all of the birthdays when uh, they when it mentions uh, somebody who had graduated from Houghton College, uh, because I was on the adjunct faculty there, there for 13 years, and I had a lot of chances to see some of you. I'm so glad I saw so many of you from this side of the room when you were my students. But uh, Sue, when you do that next month, you'll never be able to say someone graduated from Houghton College again, because my happy buck is because Houghton College was just approved as Houghton University. Uh, happy Bucks today because our Sergeant at Arms had uh, called out that I was on the radio last week, but kindly uh, gave me a, a bit of a pass in the fines, so I'll put in for that. And also uh, the Chamber of Commerce announcing last week, I believe it was, if you caught our annual awards. So our banquet is coming up in October, and we're recognizing really great people doing great work in our communities. Our Person of the Year, Stephen Cobb of the Mental Health Association our Economic Development Award, the Small Business Development Center, and then our Jamestown Community Award, Tom Benson for his community service over the years. So we're really excited about that. And a few happy bucks, because I had missed meetings previously, so I'm making up for that. Uh, happy bucks for uh, allowing me to get to know all of you and enjoy uh, networking with all of you. And happy buck, because I didn't know Bill Larson was as involved as he was until a golf tournament. And I've had a long relationship with Bill. Our first building that we bought to move the cutting room was Bill Larson's building. Uh, he is a great guy and uh, just pleased that he's a Rotarian as well. My happy buck is to welcome John Felton and also to uh, really commend him on his wonderful work that he shared in the community. It is my pleasure to welcome Dan 
Ensign Raider from the program committee to introduce our speaker. What one more happy buck, Russ? It's a happy buck to see so many happy people. Here we go, 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 go. Dan. Thanks, John. Um, so when I realized that uh, the September schedule had our Monday meeting the day after, of course, the anniversary of the September 11, 2001 attacks, uh, I thought about some different topics and potential speakers that would be somewhat related. And the first name that came to mind was Greg Carlson. Uh, brief intro, Greg is a Chautauqua County native. He currently resides in Lakewood, New York with his wife, Tricia Carlson, and their two, his two kids and three stepkids. Um, Greg is a retired United States Air Force major, 1996 to 2016 when he served, a veteran of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and is the current uh, director of veteran services for Chautauqua County. So, Greg. Good afternoon and thanks for having me. So we used to do a lot of public speaking, but then of course COVID happened. So you get out of practice, but a story I haven't told in a while, but it's one of my favorite stories because it's a true story. Well, at least 10% true. So in the military, if you tell a story, it only has to be 10% true to actually be true. But there is a surly old master sergeant. His name is James E. Burt. He's from Florida. And he said, First time I ever had to do any public speaking, he pulled me aside. He said, listen, these are the rules. Be brief, be brilliant, and be gone. And, and don't go off script. So I've already gone off script. Can I, where's the uh, fine job? Well, I'll have to, I'll, I have $3 because I won't be brilliant. So that's fine there. I probably won't be brief and I've already gone off script. So those are my $3 in fines payable to the Sergeant in Arms in honor of Master Sergeant Burt, who can't be here to be angry with me. So, well, it's a great honor to be here and share a little bit uh, about the Veteran Service Agency, which I lead, uh, and then some of my personal experiences related to my military service, then also 9-11. I was very humbled when Dan asked me uh, the Air Force core values are integrity first and then service before self. So the service before self is something I'm very familiar with. So to be able to speak to Rotarians, and that's one of your core principles is great. And then the, our third core value is excellence in all we do. So that's for the Air Force there. Um, as, I, as Dan has introduced me, my name is Greg, and I have been the Chautauqua County Veteran Service Agency Director for about six years. Vince Horgan is actually the one who hired me. And I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about our organization. So we are not the VA. A lot of people come in and say, hey, you guys are the VA, right? We're not actually the VA. We are civil servants. We work for the county and we kind of work against the VA. Not really, but we help veterans and eligible beneficiaries get benefits from the VA that they may not be able, that they may not be aware of or uh, that they may not have received otherwise. We are a small department. We only have five people. We have three full-time service officers. Dave Adams works in Dunkirk, New York. We call him Dunkirk Dave, just so everybody can remember who he is. And then Mike Rao and I are the Jamestown service officers. In addition to the three service officers, we have Carrie Finnerty. She is our administrative aide and she does all the burial benefits for veterans who are eligible for the burial benefits. And for the stones, you know, when you go to Lakeview and you see the the plaque, she's, she's the one who makes sure that we have all those done. And then we have a grant that's been around for a while now, but it's the PFC Dwyer Grant. And that is a non-clinical peer-to-peer organization that's run by Cynthia Reedy. She is our uh, program administrator, oh, sorry, coordinator. And uh, she's been doing that now for almost as long as I've been the director. So probably four and a half, five years. Um, the benefits that we primarily work with are everybody, not everybody, but most people are probably familiar with VA healthcare, like going to VA facilities. Uh, but then we also have a pension, which is for war era veterans. It's need based and they're uh, eligible spouses who require assistance with the tasks of daily living. 
And then if we had a veteran who was injured, we kind of represent them almost like an attorney would. Uh, we're accredited through New York State and also through the American Legion to represent veterans and try to get them benefits for any injuries that they may have had. And that's primarily what we do is the tangible benefits piece. A lot of the um, volunteer stuff is actually done through the local veterans organizations like the American Legion or the DAV or the VFW. We work with kind of the meat and potatoes actually. And how that benefits the county is we obviously bring in a lot of federal dollars that would replace state dollars like Medicaid. And then also if people have monthly income, they use it to shop locally, they use it to pay their property taxes, they use it to do all kinds of things that make their lives better and make the lives of other Chautauqua County business owners and residents the same way. So, you know, a little bit about the organization. I'll just tell you a little bit about my experience. Um, I was in the military for 20 years and I had an interesting take because 9-11 happened, not in the middle, but close to the middle of my time. So the military was two completely different worlds pre-9-11 and post-9-11. So it, this, is, this is a little bit interesting because at the time 9-11 happened, I was a recruiter. So as an enlisted accessions recruiter, you're not going anywhere. You're living in the community and you're recruiting young men and young women to enter the service. Not that anybody wants to go to combat, not that anybody wants to go to war, but when 9-11 happened and I was a recruiter, my biggest fear was I joined the military so that I could serve my country and serve overseas if I need to, and I'm never gonna get a chance to do it because I'm here as a recruiter and this thing's gonna be over in six months or 12 months or whatever we were thinking at the time that 9-11 happened. Little did I know I'd go six times. So because you, you wouldn't believe that that was 21 years ago and it wasn't until about a year ago uh, that the wars ultimately wound down and ended. So prior to 9-11, uh, we were, the Cold War was over and a lot of my senior leaders actually served in Vietnam. And I remember after 9-11 happened, we didn't go to work for a couple of days, they closed all the recruiting offices and when I went back to work, the thing that was most shocking to me was the number of 80 plus year old World War II veterans. There were still a lot uh, that were still with us then who came to the office and wouldn't leave because they said, there's gotta be something that I can do. These, these young guys out here, they should be here raising their kids and they should be taking care of their families. And they should, I'm, I'm an old man or I'm an, I'm an old woman. I've lived my life, send me. And they couldn't understand why I couldn't make that happen. I said, well, the age limit is 27. So you're just a bit outside. But, you know, if things change, we'll keep that in mind. But it, it's not even anecdotal. I can't tell you the number of people that came to the office and said, can I help in some way? What can I do? How can I serve? Hey, I can, I can cook. I can, you know, I can carry whatever. They, they, they said, even if I can't fight anymore, I can still do something. So it was amazing how patriotic everyone was right after 9-11 happened. Um, the other thing that was interesting, we were, we were talking about this, um, smartphones. Like that's, that's kind of a new phenomenon. It feels like we've always, it feels like we've always had access to all the world's knowledge at our fingertips always, but that wasn't the case. So at the time 9-11 happened, it was, it was pretty common to have a cell phone, but nobody certainly had a smartphone, and people didn't live on their phones. So I was a recruiter, and I was at Niagara Falls uh, Reserve Station, and our instructors back then had a strict no-phone policy, so we all had to leave our you know, phones outside the building. And it was 8 o'clock when we started our class, and we had an option. He said, hey, we can take a break, or we can work straight through and we'll, we'll, we'll take an early lunch. So that was at about eight o'clock. Being a reserve base and being a weekday, the base was empty. There, there was really nothing going on. We were kind of the only show in town. We were there doing our annual trainings, our fiscal year ends September 30th. So we had to get it all done in September before the new fiscal year started. So we came out after our break and everybody had 10, 12, 13 missed calls. We, everybody did. We, we couldn't figure out what had gone on. So we, were, we came out of this like warehouse building and the base was filled with people. Uh, people wearing body armor, people had drawn rifles from the armory, they had re 
it, in, in a two hour period, we went from a very, very, very quiet day to what's going on. So then of course, at that point, we went all over the base trying to find a TV that we could watch so that we could see what was going on with 9-11. Now, prior to that, um, people who had served in the military, Desert Storm was so quick and it was such a decisive victory that almost no one had any sort of combat or deployment experience. Um, the Vietnam guys, but by that point, they were 30 years into their careers and they were command sergeant majors and they were general officers and they were no longer at the tactical level. So for us, it was a new experience and the entire military changed after that. And it actually got to be a point where as I was getting later in my career, there were people who were in the service that didn't remember a non-combat military. They don't remember training. They don't remember what life was like before you had that constant cycle up to go overseas. And, and for 20 years, there, there are some people that enlisted in 2001 that retired in 2021. And for the entirety of their 20 year career in the military, they were combat ready. I mean, they, they could, they, we used to measure our, how tough we were by how many exercises we'd done and how bad those exercises were. And then once 9-11 happened, there was, no, there was no such thing as exercises anymore. It was all training to get ready to go do the real thing. So it was a dramatic change from pre-9-11 to post-9-11. Um, the other interesting thing that was different was the hardships that we faced were so different than the hardships of those who served during World War II and Korea and Vietnam. So technology is a wonderful thing, right? I'm able to be in Afghanistan or be in Iraq and send emails and communicate with my family. And at some places, you could even Skype. But the downside of that was I would be Skyping with my family and then a mortar attack would hit and the sirens would go off and we'd have to immediately turn off what we were doing and run to the shelters. And that I think is a totally different type of, you're so, connect, you know, you're so connected to home, but then you're also in a completely, completely and totally different place. Whereas I think uh, in World War II, Korea, even Vietnam, it would have been so hard to be away from your family and be disconnected. And, and only thing you get is letters and very intermittently um, that would have been very hard, but in some ways you could segregate. You could segregate the mission you were doing there versus the mission that we had there. And with, with the technology being what it was post 9-11, um, it was just a different experience because you felt very much like you were connected to home. And then you also felt very much like you were in a completely different world. So to kind of go from that transition to pre 9-11, where email and cell phones were there, but a very, very sparsely used thing to everybody being so connected. It was just a totally different experience than what veterans had before. Um, the other thing that's quite a bit different is there was a continuous draft and that continuous draft went from World War II all the way through the Vietnam era. So you had hundreds of thousands of people who served a very short period of time. Uh, the post 9-11 military is a small group of people and 55% of the force is a career force. So rather than have that group of guys that go for, for two to three years, they serve, they do one deployment and then they're out. You have a group of people serving now who deploy over and over and over again. So I had six deployments in my career and that's not uncommon for people who served like my contemporaries who served at the same time as I do. So I think the mental health aspect of that um, is there's a different level of disconnect. Uh, not, not better, not worse, because war is a horrible thing regardless of how you look at it, but just a different group uh, of dynamics that I think affects what we have today. I notice volunteers, you know, people are so much more likely to volunteer of the older generations. So the uh, World War II is pretty much gone. But like when we do things in the community, the veterans who show up are the guys who are 
older where I think the younger veterans don't do that, I don't know if it's just because we're different as a society or if it's because you know, they didn't serve for two or three years, they served for 10 years or 12 years or 15 years, and they've done six, five, you know, five or six deployments, and they just don't have that same desire to, to give back. And I, and I hope that that, I hope that that changes. Uh, I find it very interesting that I have Korean War veterans delivering meals to uh, OEF and OIF veterans that are my age or younger. It seems a little bit backwards to me, but that's just kind of the world that we live in right now where the, the volunteerism and the people willing to serve their community are of an older generation as opposed to a younger generation. Um, like I said, I go off script a little bit, but uh, anyways, I uh, can't say enough about uh, this group of people and what you guys do for the community. And I appreciate you letting me come here and share a little bit of my uh, experience in the military and, and some of my service uh, and what I experienced pre-9-11 pre and post-9-11. And does anybody have any questions? I don't know if questions are appropriate or... Do you... Hello? Hello. Hello. Do you... Um run a job placement um, office through your uh, agency? We do not do job placement or job placement. We, we can refer people out if they're looking. Uh, there's actually a New York State uh, employee that does specifically veterans um, hiring and we can refer people out to that. Our office does primarily benefits. Do you? <laughs> do you? Do you have offices outside of the county available? So in the New York, right yes. Yeah, so in the New York State Constitution requires that each uh, county have a veteran service officer, a veteran service agency. So every county in New York State has a someone who does what we do. We have two offices here in Chautauqua County. Yeah, we have one in Dunkirk and we have one in Jamestown. But throughout the state, every county has a service agency. Thank you. I appreciate very much your life and what you've been doing. <clears throat> but I've always had a feeling that anybody, male or female, anybody that was in combat duty should never, never have another want in their life. There should be no property tax. They shouldn't have to wait until they, they could go buy a car. A car should be made available to them every time one comes out. And every medical want or need or anything that they have in their life should be free to anybody who was ever in combat duty. And then we are still only thanking them that much of which they deserve. So God, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for having these kind of people in our life and doing things that we couldn't do. I had in my family, I had three uh, uncles that went in World War, World War II, and they were, they, they were prior to World War II when they got involved. One was on the battleship Tennessee the morning of Pearl Harbor, and he only had anything that happened to him was a broken eardrum, which did heal. I had one that was in North Africa and all the way through Italy and all the way up to Anzio, and they were in a long time. One of the youngest uncles was in the anti-aircraft in the Pacific. They were gone from the time they left till they, by the time they joined and left until they got back home again was five years away. And they all come home healthy. And uh, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Recently, I've been following um, some controversial, I shouldn't say controversial, uh, the crash of Kobe Bryant, uh, his helicopter uh, in California, and the photographs that were taken by um, sheriff and all of that, and have been shared. How do you uh, govern the, the use of smartphones in combat? And what the military may take and are they allowed to have their phone in combat and what are they allowed to share that is a fantastic question and i love topics like this 
It is impossible. I can tell you as someone who has been a leader, it is impossible to regulate what people are recording and doing on their cell phones. Shenanigans have happened as long as there has been combat from thousands of years ago to now. There were things that have happened that nobody would ever want to know about or see or hear of. And with cell phones, with people taking pictures, with people, everything is captured. Okay. So the bad stuff is captured. And sometimes things that may seem bad that actually are not bad are also captured but the picture or the video lacks context. So we definitely have rules. Uh, we have teams of lawyers who figure this stuff out and you cannot, there's certain things you're not supposed to take pictures of, obviously any classified information, any operational information, any sort of battle damage assessment, which would include casualties. You are absolutely not supposed to, but people, still do. There's no, you can try to regulate it. It is an impossible task. Unfortunately, that is something that like our military leaders today deal with that's very difficult and, and there's no, and, and, and that's not just for important things like combat, like where you, terrible things get out. I'm talking a bunch of airmen go downtown on a Friday night and they push it up a little bit too hard and there's pictures of their time out you know, and then somebody takes exception to that. And then that becomes an issue to leadership. And, you know, it, it is complicated things to a degree that's, I can't, I, it'd take me hours. Yeah. Greg, I, first of all, I wanted to say hi. Hi. I didn't know, I, I didn't even realize that was you here. So at any rate, um, <laughs> We had worked together with the Dwyer program, and that was quite a privilege when I was at the Jackson Center. But I'm wondering if there are things that a club like ours could do to be supportive of veterans in the community um, through that program. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with an unpopular take on this. Uh, as much as I appreciate what the gentleman said over here about combat veterans and, and what veterans, what opportunity should be afforded to them. I think that veterans should be asking the Rotary Club, how can we volunteer? How can we serve our community? How can we do things to make lives better around here? Now, obviously, I'm sure there's things that, that any group can do, but um, there's a lot of things that are in place to benefit veterans. Being a veteran does not absolve you of being a good citizen. And I think that more veterans should take a leadership role in organizations like Rotary, in organizations like CAP, in other, in, instead of waiting for things to happen for them, go out and do things for others. I know that's not a popular take. I'd probably get, you know, veterans would be hunting me down as I walk out of here for saying that, but, but, so, but so frequently, and, and maybe it's a generational thing, maybe it's a generational thing, but like I said, we have volunteers who deliver meals to veterans in need, and it's typically people who should be having meals delivered to them. Cultural change. People are too fixated on themselves and not fixated on what they can do to help other people. Just my opinion. I even tell young people that like when, that, when they say like, what can I do because I feel bad, I feel bad, I feel bad. I go, I'll start doing stuff for other people and you're gonna feel a lot better. Take some of the focus off of yourself. What can you do for your brother or your sister or your mom or your uncle or whoever in your life is around you that's struggling rather than fixating on your own individual problems. So, Greg, we meet uh, every Monday at noon. You're always welcome. One of Rotary's major international programs is eradicate polio in the world. We're down just to a few countries in the world where polio exists. In honor and thanks for your presentation to our Rotary Club, we'll make a donation in your name that will vaccinate four children who will never experience polio in their life. So, thank you.
And thank you, everyone. Remember this year's international theme, Imagine Rotary. We are adjourned.